Welcome to the Mental Insights Podcast, a conversation aimed at understanding all sides of mental health, addiction recovery, and homelessness. Each interview will include one's personal experiences and insights, earn experts' advice and knowledge within one of these fields. The goal is to promote awareness, guidance, and support for anyone who is affected by these challenges. Thank you all for listening. Welcome back to the Mental Insights Podcast. This is your host, Brennan Catulli, and we're here today for season two, episode number 19 with Milan Sox. This is part two of the episode, and we'll be speaking about her debut film, The Other Side of the White Line. So in the previous episode, we spoke about sobriety, what you really were able to face, what you were able to overcome, what kind of steps you took in order to be here today, be in your second year of sobriety. So, you know, to really start off and, you know, kind of continue on what you were just speaking about in the past episode of how creative writing was a good outlet, a good tool for you, as well as photography, what kind of really even motivated you to get into that field to, you know, get your bachelor's within creative writing and as well, you know, motivate you to want to do a film? Um, so I went to, um, I went to high school in like in Madison, um, Connecticut. And for half the day, I went to the educational center for the arts in New Haven. So like I had a split day. So like at 12 o'clock, I would take a bus to New Haven and go to school for acting. Um, which was an incredible it was an incredible experience. It was, it was, it was like forming, um, in my life. And it was just like, it was great. So, um, from there, when I was applying to college, for some reason, um, I really wanted to start writing and, um, it makes sense. I mean, I've been writing since I was really young, but I really, I just was like, I want to try a different kind of aspect of, um, the creative arts in general. So I applied to schools for writing and I chose Emerson. I love Boston. It was so much fun. Um, And then my junior year, my junior year, I think. Yeah, I switched or I added a minor in photography. Um, For me, they they go hand in hand. They're both stories. Photographs to me are, you know, it's just another way that I observe um, the world. Same with writing. Um, and then, you know, uh, my, you know, my senior year came around, like I, I said previously, and I had to, you know, make theses for both. Um, and my writing thesis was in a, a a group of poems that I had been writing since I was since the year before so I by the time I was like making the thesis in order to be in like a year since I had like started writing these poems um I wrote them through addiction and in rehab and then into sobriety I like finished um I like you know put them together into a book basically I think there was about 40 something poems. And um, for I mean, for me, like the poems were all like visual. They were so, they were like images in my head. They were, they were definitely like um, scenes to me. Um, I saw everything. Like there was, there was a storyline that I didn't know of yet when I was, um, when I was putting them together, but like there was something like very like clear connecting all of them. And I think that, that there, there was, um, one or two characters in these poems, um, that I could picture in my head. So, um, and then for my, my photo thesis, I, it was, it was about, it was, um, it was really about like me understanding like my, my image, um, my physical image, like in a photograph, um, the, the project I did was, um, basically there was a bunch of photographs and pieces of writing and, um, 
uh, you know, drawings from childhood and anything that I felt connected to um, my process through addiction and sobriety um, about my self image as a person. And it was called fake ID. Um, I had several fake IDs. <laughs> um, so that's part of the reason that I called it that. But uh, it was behind a curtain and you had to walk in with a flashlight because um, it was completely in the dark. And they were all spread out on the wall and you, as the, the viewer got to pick what you were looking at of my identity. Um, there were a lot of photographs that were put on that wall that I don't remember being taken. Um, so for me, that, that was another part of like exploring like um, kind of what addiction did to me and, and, uh, and then coming out of that, like who I am now. I mean, that's a huge thing that a lot of people go through when they become sober. It's like, wait, who am I? Like, what? <laughs> I'm like awake now. Um, so the, like, so I had, you know, the writing side and I had the visual side, like in my head, like there was something going on. Like there was this kind of like, um, underlying story there. And I, I realized that I just kind of wanted to be, to make something that, um, was from the point of view of, an addict alcoholic um and there are movies that um i've seen that are like that heaven knows what is one of um it's an amazing film and um the main character in it harley is um she wrote it it was like a, a series of like memoirs that she wrote and then the safety brothers like help her put it together um into a film like they translated it into like a kind of a script form um, so that was like, you know, a really good example of, of, um, I guess an addict alcoholic being represented correctly. Um, so for me, like, that's why I, I started making this film. Cause I was like, um, I do have this angle, you know what I mean? Like I do have like, um, this experience and the film that I ended up making came from the poems. And um, it's fictional, it's not entirely true. Definitely pulled from a lot of true events in my life, but um, the point is it's not just my, it's not just like my story. It's not, um, you know, a nonfiction story about my life. It's, it's really me trying to capture the, all the different people that can be an alcoholic or an addict. Um, and how they're viewed and how, um, and how they behave. It's really like about, yeah, like their behavior as people. Um, so yeah, I don't know if I answered your question. <laughs> no, it's valuable, valuable advice and kind of insights that you're bringing about in terms of what, you know, the film's going to bring about and kind of what brought you to be in this position. And I think, you know, one thing that you brought up is as, as you're doing this, you know, this is a great healing process for other people in terms of sharing experiences and sharing emotions, you know, that you experience this, but as well for yourself, you know, still two years into sobriety, it can still be an early process of still being able to learn about yourself and learn what you've experienced. As you said, some photos you didn't even know you didn't couldn't even remember what happened and you know as you've even gone throughout this process you know has there been new aspects that you've learned about yourself like kind of what has been the process of you know creating this film creating this you know storyline of this film and you know have you been able to learn new things throughout this process of you know about yourself, about your storyline, and as well, how you want to convey, you know, these messages of what drugs and alcohol can do to someone's life, you know, how has this really been a healing process of, you know, learning what people go through, because as you're writing the story, you're really reliving a lot of 
what you went through and, you know, how has that played in terms of just, you know, still working through, you know, your own sobriety and your own recovery? Yeah. Um, I think that so like what I've, what I've learned, um, I didn't, I didn't think that I could write a film because I've never done it before. Um, and it's definitely not perfect or even close, but um, I finished something. <laughs> um, that was like a huge thing for me. Like even just finishing writing the script, um, even though it's never like technically done, you know, cause there's so much that changes, but like actually just like giving someone a script and being like, uh, this is what I wrote. That was a huge thing for me. Cause I was like, Oh my gosh, I did this. Like I actually finished something. Um, like leading people, uh, is a crazy concept for me. I've always liked, um, I remember like when I was younger group projects, I liked, you know, being in charge, but it wasn't like a pushy thing. I just, I did, you know, I did like being the one to like, um, help people like figure things out. Like I've always been that type of person and I've had leadership positions, but they definitely went away once I started really getting into drinking and I, I didn't believe in myself whatsoever. Um, so being able to get a group of people together um that like want to be part of something that i made is like incredible um and being able to have people reach out to me and be like can i be a part of this and not me without me asking like that is so wonderful um because it really, it gives me like, just a feeling that like people believe in me. And then it allows me to believe in myself too. Um, and like, I, I didn't think that I was like organized at all. Um, and there's always things that I can learn, but like within, you know, just like finishing out school as a senior doing an internship, like, um, planning trips with my friends, just like things that I, I didn't think I can do, I can totally do, you know, organizing a film um, and trusting the process of that and not being, um, you know, not giving up on it is like a huge, a huge thing for me, like actually following through with what I say I'm gonna do um, has been a huge thing that I'm learning. Um, knowing that um, you can't get stuff handed to you. Like, that's a huge thing for me. I, I've i always been like a hard worker in school for sure. Um, so, and like, I've always liked school, like I said. So I didn't expect things to come easy, but like once, oh my gosh, like once I actually started trying my senior year, um, it was like, the difference of night and day between my junior year and my senior year like it was in, it was insane like i didn't even it, things just came so they actually came easier when i tr tried harder you know what i mean like it, it was a, it was just like such a big realization for me i was like oh like the more work i put in the more the the, the better the outcome is going to be um so that was a huge thing for me to learn even though i had already known that in my life i had forgotten and then i came back to it um, so I'm relearning that now again and with this film, definitely. Cause I have never done this before. So yeah. Oh, and asking for help. Huge thing. Um, actually saying to someone like, I don't know how to do this. And then, then being like, can I help you? And then me being like, yes, uh, that's huge. That is like unheard of in my vocabulary, um, like two years ago. So being vulnerable too, like just like throwing it all out there um, and just being like, I, you know, 
I don't know how to you do, do any of this or um, even being vulnerable, sharing my story and sharing the stories that are in the film um, is something that I, I don't know. I just thought that everything I had to do had to be so in uh, solo and as an individual um, that I, I definitely would not share my feelings before as much so this, yeah just like so much like I'm learning so much every day like every single day I'm like learning something about myself yeah absolutely that's the <laughs> yeah. beauty of it I mean that's that's the joy of it when you come to that realization and that you know perspective of of what's possible and what you can do and you know you spoke a little bit about the process of you know working throughout this film writing the script but why don't you give everybody a little bit of insight in terms of you know, what's to come, what can they expect in, you know, the near future as, you know, in the end of the epi uh, previous episode, we spoke about the GoFundMe page. Why don't you speak about, you know, the process that you're fundraising today? And then, you know, what are kind of your next steps and hopes for, you know, to come of filming this and taking that next step for what people can expect? Yeah, great. Um, so the GoFundMe page is, um, it's been up for a bit and we're trying to raise $10,000 for this film. Um, we're at about, on the page it's like, I think 2,700, but I have, you know, some in, in my own savings. So we're around like 37 right now. Um, and because of coronavirus pandemic, um there has definitely been some postponing for um being able to basically organize everything we need to organize to actually shoot um many, many like rental houses are closed are closed for you know um renting equipment and for renting lighting and um having everyone feel safe on set um has been you know an issue that my producer and I have talked about so as of right now our hope is to shoot <clears throat> in September or October but there there might be a longer um, period of time before we actually are able to first of all raise all the money because I know you know in this situation right now um, a lot of people are um, you know struggling with that aspect a lot of unemployment um, but also just like making sure that like everyone, you know, feels okay, um, who is part of this because, uh, as we've seen coronavirus is definitely, um, has affected a lot of people, um, families and just, it's, it's made life kind of go on pause, which is how the world is working, which is fine. Um, but I just, for me, like, I don't want to rush the process. So, um, it may be postponed further than October. However, um, there's so much information on my GoFundMe page. And um, I also have my email on that page. So if anyone wants to reach out and ask me any questions um, about the film, please feel free. Um, also on my Instagram page, it's at 35MMAN. Um, there's a lot of information there as well. And um, yeah, you can like see everyone who's involved and um, just like kind of where we're at, which is, you know, we're pretty far along at this point. We're just kind of waiting it out for the right time. Yeah. Awesome. And, you know, once this is filmed, where can, where are your hopes in terms of where it's going to be, you know, released? Where can people see it? What is kind of that avenue of how uh, you're planning to release this film? So down the road, once the film is released, um, my hope is, you know, I, we would submit it into film competitions um, and also let people watch it uh, for free, obviously. Um, but I, I, this is my like bigger, you know, my bigger dream is that I'm somehow able to, you know, submit it to contests and then, um, raise even more money in hopes to support an individual to attend a rehabilitation uh, facility. Because I think that um, 
oh, it changed my life. So for someone else to have that opportunity would, would be like an amazing thing for me to be able to give back to someone else. Um, yeah, that's my hope. That yeah. is like my goal. It's like one of the reasons I'm making this film to basically like um, almost as uh, make it as like a, um, I don't know how to explain it. Not an advertisement, but like a kind of a conversation starter in which um, people can really think about like what an addict alcoholic is um, and how, you know, a lot of like the stigma and like, there's just so much like blindness around like um, how people who have this disease are perceived and therefore the people who have this disease don't know that they have it. <laughs> so for me, it's just like, even if like one person who can see it, who has, you know, um, <clears throat> this problem could like watch this film and like they could connect to it, like, and want to make a change. Like I would want to support that person, um, in getting there. Yeah. That's awesome. It's definitely great to hear and, uh, definitely admirable admirable goal to have and kind of can be a good transition into this last question of, you know, higher hopes past this film and what you want to do in supporting someone seeking out rehabilitation. For my last question, I'd like to ask my guest this hypothetical situation. If you did have, you know, a larger sum of money, what kind of resources, what kind of, you know, help would you provide people in terms of, you know, you spoke about supporting someone going to rehabilitation, you know, what other means do you think would be incredibly helpful for someone who is, you know, in this situation of, you know, having this disease of being an alcoholic, being, being an addict, what are the best ways in which you think we could support those people, we could help them, uplift them out of these situations, if you had you know, an infinite supply of money, what kind of realms do you think you would allocate the resources in order to, you know, fight this? You know, we are in this coronavirus pandemic, but there's also this, you know, incredibly large pandemic happening within drugs and alcohol. Like this is a serious issue that's happening within, you know, our society today. So, you know, how could we support these people if we had, you know, this amount of resources to do so? My, um, I feel like, I feel like everything um, that, I guess, like education. So like education is like something that I feel like can every path can lead back to like how you're educated about something. Um, so, you know, if I had a hypothetical, a large sum of money, I, I would probably, and I haven't been in high school in a while, um, I would reshape, I would like use funding to reshape and uh, like basically train people to, um, or like hire people to start different programs within schools um, and like in classes, like I would make a class about this, um, basically like just structuring how um, alcohol and drugs are discussed. Um, because when I was in high school, like we would have these classes, like it was, um, I forget what the class was called, but it was like also like sex ed too. It was like all in one. I actually, I don't know what it was called. But the point is that I, oh my God, it was, it was like scare tactic. It was, it was not, I think the way that we were supposed to go about this. Um, and I was supposed to learn about it. And maybe for some other people it stuck, but I've had conversations with many people um, and they've had really similar experiences in their high school. They're like, oh yeah, like it would, you know, our teacher would show us a photo of a woman um, with like no teeth. And like, that was how we learned about like not to do meth. And I'm like, that's not enough. Like, 
it's it's like a it's like that's one way to go about it but that's like that's not enough um i think what is the problem that we have right now and and maybe things have changed significantly but i i don't think they have like drastically um is that the way in which like alcoholics and addicts and the way in which um there's just like a huge stigma around it and i think that it's come at an angle that is it's very um it, it's, it's like it's trying to you know scare um like youth and like you know anyone um in those classes to to not do drugs from like that standpoint but i think that um there should just be like a huge reshape in the way that like people are educated about it because um when you see photos of people with like no teeth you're like oh i'm never gonna get to that like that's not me you know there's no like connection there um and so there needs to be like giant group discussions about this i mean like this is not a joke there uh, since i got out of high school i've known like four three three people um, from my high school and from other areas in my life who have died from this um it's just like what what can we how can we change this you know um and i think that it's reshaping the way that it's it's being taught because not everyone's afraid of photos like that or not everyone can like actually like conceptualize um like these video scenarios you see of like one party you know what i mean um and there needs to be like a fuller conversation about it and um i just feel like that is like that is like one way that like we can help people because I think when, when you learn something when you're young, it can stick with you if you're taught it correctly. Um, otherwise, like, I don't know, there's so many problems with addiction. Like, <laughs> it's so heartbreaking. Um, pharmaceutical companies can stop prescribing people like Adderall and things that like are basically meth and um, benzo benzos and xanax and everything out of the sun i mean like narcotics i don't know there's so many problems but if i had money i would i would reshape the way that people are educated about it for sure absolutely yeah. i mean it's, i was so long-winded sorry no not at all i mean it it brings about the thing that you were talking about earlier in terms of you know what you really enjoyed about the community within aa it's sharing similar experiences and as you said, you know, when children see pictures of people not having teeth or, you know, these extreme measures, a child, a teenager can't connect with that. And that's not something that you could really connect with and say like, oh, that's what it's going to be. So, you know, I think as you're saying, reshaping the way it's taught and educated amongst, you know, young adults, teenagers can definitely do, you know, such a big, uh, help in terms of trying to fight the stigma that is surrounding this. So, you know, it's definitely valuable insight and, you know, we'll certainly see more in terms of, you know, what you're doing to educate other people through the work that you're doing with your film, as well as just advocating throughout sharing your story and sharing, you know, your own message. So everybody can be sure to check out in the show notes, your Instagram, your email can check out the GoFundMe and make sure to be in touch if you have any questions or if you have any insights in order to help Milan move through with this project, her film, The Other Side of the White Line. So thank you all for listening and thank you, Milan, for taking this time out to be on the Mental Insights Podcast. Thank you so much. It was nice to, it was nice to be part of this. Thank you. Absolutely. Thank you all again for listening. This was your host, Brennan Catulli, and this was season two, episode number 19 of the Mental Insights Podcast. Thank you all for listening to today's episode of the Mental Insights Podcast. Make sure to reach out to today's guest or myself if you need any advice, guidance, or support in your life today. 
Please be sure to like, subscribe, and review to this podcast so we know what you thought of this episode. I look forward to being in touch with you all in the next episode. I hope you all have a wonderful day.